My name is John Sylvester. I'm Australia's longest serving crime reporter and write a weekly column for The Age. Many of my colleagues have wondered why I've never bothered to move to other areas of the paper. The reason's pretty simple. I've got the best job in journalism, playing cops and robbers and getting paid for it. Over more than 40 years, I've covered some of Australia's biggest crimes and met fascinating characters on both sides of the law. In this series, you'll hear from them, the cops and the crooks, telling their stories. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Naked City. Christopher Dean Binns is Australia's most prolific escape artist and an old school bank robber, who is now an institutionalised prisoner. His first confirmed theft was at the age of four. He was a ward of the state at 14 and was in Pentridge at 17. He well and truly earned his nickname, Badness. He was seriously dangerous, but he certainly had his own funny side. After one Melbourne armed robbery, police didn't have to work hard to establish the identity of the offender. Binns took out a classified ad in the Herald Sun announcing, Badness is back. He sent Melbourne Armed Robbery Squad detectives Christmas cards with messages such as, wish you were here, and one covered with dollar signs. Police said one of the greetings was signed, Lord Badness. Ken Ashworth was a career cop and a man who spent years chasing serious crooks in Specialist Task Force and the Armed Robbery Squad. It was in 1991 that Ken first started to take an interest in bins. There'd been a series of stick-ups at banks. It was pretty clear it was the same offender. In each one, the bandit was getting just that little bit more professional. Ken knew he had to be stopped. He has known Bins for nearly 30 years, and over that time, they developed a grudging respect for each other. Ken is a cracking bloke, respected on both sides of the law. I caught up with him at his home on a summer's afternoon. The beer fridge was outside awaiting a hard rubbish collection. It had done its tour of duty. Now we're sitting with Ken Ashworth, who had one of the most unique relationships with Christopher Dean Binns, known as Badness. You've you've had this sort of on-again, off-again relationship. So you were in the armed robbery squad in the early 90s. Yes, that's right. Binns comes up on the radar. How so? It was about 1991, I think, midway through 91, and uh, he absconded on bail. And uh, we had a couple of armed hold-ups on uh, banks that were very similar to the... or the MO was very similar to the one that Binns had been charged with. So uh, we started to have a bit of a look at look at him and some of his associates, and the more we looked into it, it was, uh, became more and more obvious that was his MO. What's his MO? What made it unique? Uh, stealing the two cars, they were generally Fords. Uh, the, the keys, uh, uh, the ignition had been manipulated a certain way, which was a, a unique thing to Binns. Um, his demands when he entered the bank and how he did it and uh, the uh, the firepower that he carried was, was quite heavy. Was he a cocky sort of band? As he got better at his craft, yes. When he first started, he was pretty amateur, but having said that, he started when he was about 16 or 17. So by the time he was uh, jumping counters at banks, holding um, uh, customers at bay, he was pretty good, pretty good. He knew, his, he knew his stuff. He was in and out, he knew time limits. Bin soon realised Ken was after him, and it was the robber who reached out to the copper. Um, so I was sitting at the office there one day and the phone rings, it's actually him. In fact, he rang me several times when he was on the run. Uh, he rang me from Sydney, he rang me from Queensland, he rang me from... Um, Victoria, and he uh, he's pretty good. He said, uh, I know you'll try and trace the call, so I'm only going to be on the line for 30 seconds, and it's uh, not, a, not a private address. So he's pretty switched on and um, a bit of a character, and he, uh, he started calling me Ashes, and because uh, everybody calls me Ashy or whatever like that, but he said, no, Ashes, I, I like Ashes. So he said, I'll put something in the paper. OK, and uh, so... In the classifieds of the Herald Sun, um, it'd go right in um, to Ashes, Badness is back and Binns is back and things like this. Um, so he was sort of taunting us, but in a, in a jovial sort of way. Did he, did he send a 
Christmas card or something. He did. he did. I got several Christmas cards over the years from him. But one that sticks in the mind was the um, a picture of a bank robber or Santa Claus. It is. He's got this big bag of cash and he's running away. So I thought that was very funny. But uh, he, he was a bit of a character. Um, anyway, he was probably too smart and cheeky for his own good because it was, I think, early 92 or something, or mid-92. He robbed the same bank out at Noble Park, which was the State Savings Bank. And he robbed it in exactly the same manner that he did previously for which he'd been charged. Those were the charges he absconded on. And right down to, in fact, the almost identical clothing, identical car. And uh, we knew at that stage, that was just typical bins, but we knew at that stage he was living in Bundaberg because we were able to, to track him on a number of uh, avenues of inquiry that we were doing. So we split our resources to the scene and went out to the, um, to the airport and uh, bingo, a couple of hours later, we got him at the airport. He looked at me and sort of had a wry smile and um, he said, so we finally meet. <laughs> that was a bit of a character. And uh, I said, yes, Chris, uh, you know, how, how are things, how are you? He says, yeah, yeah, OK. I said, right, we'll go back to the office and we're going to interview you back there. And he goes, yeah, OK. So we get back to the office and... Bins gave a formal no-comment record of interview at the St Kilda Road Armed Robbery Squad office. But as he wasn't bashed, he agreed to have an off-the-record chat over a few beers. So we get back to the office and um, he gets put through the attendance register and into the interview rooms. And he's just sitting there. So I go in and just start having a chat to him, which was put him right off because I was being nice to him because he openly says, you know, coppers have always given him a hard time and a clip over the year when he was young and out in the streets and things like that. So we're just sitting there and having a chat and bits and pieces and he says, well, we're going to get on with it? And I said, yeah, but there's no hurry. I think, I think it was a Friday night from memory, but I can't remember. So there's no hurry. Uh, you're not going anywhere. Um, we just got to do what we're going to do. I'm just here to talk to you. And he was just really put off. Felt it, felt like... So uh, we had a couple of refreshments there and a bit of a chat. Because he actually expelled it, expected to get a quilting. Correct, yeah. And didn't he say that he always did. happens? He did. He, he, he did say that. He said, I'm expecting a hiding. And I said, well, you're not going to get one. And he says, how come? I said, well, I don't need to. You've got evidence against you. You know, it's just a matter of process as far as I'm concerned. Um, how you've been treated by other people in the past is not my concern. But, you know, I've done the investigation, we've got the evidence, and you're going to be charged with a number of armed robberies. He goes, oh, OK. And he was quite surprised and a uh, little bit shocked. And so we just sat there and had a, had a preamble a conversation and, and a chat. Um, it was recorded, and then we... but it was actually off the record. In that chat, it's a little bit like a fastball on a batsman discussing the day's play over a few beers. This is the first time we get to speak person to person and find out what makes Chris Bins tick. Ken had been chasing Bins for months, so when they finally had a chat, Ken really wanted to know what made Chris Bins tick. Oh, I told him to know any sound. You never know. Never Clearly, Bins has respect for Ken and actually wants to know what Ken thinks of him. Um, and what do you think of me personally? You personally? I have no particular opinion about you at all. I just get paid to um, investigate uh, robberies. That's it. You've done nothing personally to me. I, I haven't got anything against you. I'm just going uh, But would you have treated me the same if I was a judge? Yeah. Well, I treat people the way they treat me. Ken wants to know why a crook as smart as Bin's would make such a stupid decision as to rob the same bank twice and then catch a flight in a way that he was almost certain to get caught. Was it right with it? No, it wasn't worth it, you know why? It would have been worth it if I hadn't caught that fucking time. Even though he was stealing up to 250 grand a time, he was still a bit of a tight ass, paying only $89 for a cheap airfare. Why'd you jump on the website? I oh, know, you know, even though I had all that money, that was a cheap fare. I was 89 bucks. Yeah, but I thought I'd get the money back. He could have almost chartered his own plane, a jet called Badness. He went back to the bank at Noble Park because he wanted police to know it was him. 
He just didn't expect them to work it out that quickly. If you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And remember to rate and comment on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Unless, of course, you don't like it, then shut up. Unfortunately for Chris, the second robbery at Noble Park wasn't as fruitful as he thought it would be. Same bank. Twice. And he managed only to get 20 grand. 20? 20? 20,000? So if you go for 100 grand, what's to say, six months, and you expect 20 grand from today, that's not going to last too very long at that lifestyle. Which was about half what he got the last time. What was your last time on that one? 50. 50. Would you have been expecting about the same amount? What was the difference? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's why he chose the cheapest economy fare. Well, how come he got 50 last time? Oh, no. What did you do to tell us today? What happened last time? I've got number one camera. She had all the big bundles. The last time? The one you've been chosen? She had all the big, she had all the good stuff. When he asked if he knows people at the bank or how he knows bank tellers have big bundles of cash, he said it was pretty easy. I just asked them. How do you work that out? How do you know? Just ask that. Things like that. Just ask that. Ken Ashworth and the other detective can see that Chris is starting to open up and they want to question him on some other jobs and work out exactly his methods. Do you set yourself a time limit to be inside a bank? Or do you just get the... How do you do it? But Chris catches himself and realises he's probably giving a little bit too much away. You need to get carried away now. I'm getting carried away from being fucking talking like this. But it just intrigues me that you've got, you, you obviously know they've got hold up alarms and oh, yeah, you know, once the cameras are activated and you notice know, pull things like that, the alarm goes. So obviously the police are going to arrive within a period of time. Do you give yourself a period of time? If you don't do a countdown in the bank, give yourself time. Although Bin says, gee, you know me better than I do, he still knows that there's a boundary between the cop and the crook. When he's asked, how'd you get to the airport, he laughs and says, you're going to have to work that out yourself. Ken responds, I guess that's our job. Ken keeps pressing and Bin starts to dodge and weave. If you got away today, would you come back to Victoria at all? Not at all? No. Chris seems to suggest he would have liked to have reformed and stopped robbing. What would you have done? They've gone overseas, like I said. With plans to go overseas. What would you do? But when he talks of the few weeks he went straight, he confuses the cops. Who was the last one we worked? When Chris says that he worked as a kitchen hand at the union, what do you do? Kitchen hand. The police think he's talking about the trade union. Five, six weeks. Who are you helping out there? Just give it a pay for it. But he's actually talking about the Union Hotel, which is a pub in Melbourne. The Union Hotel. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking about the Union as in the Union Pillars Library or something. Chris sounds like he's thoroughly enjoying himself. Why don't you do that in the first place? Why don't you take up on the banks? Why don't you go out? What excitement. Is that right? How long does that last for? At the end of the day, Chris loved robbing banks and he was addicted to the rush that he got from it. You don't know what it feels like. I've never robbed a bank enough. But you know what it feels like on a raid, wouldn't you? Right, you're in control. Your blood goes, starts 
advice you can give your career after your life, darling. So, it's a bit more of an exciting addiction. Listening closely to the tape, I can hear beer cans opening in the background. While that wasn't taught at detective training school, it shows that treating people well is more productive than being a bully boy. When it was all over, that was it. And uh, that was still, still part of the shock that he could just, just couldn't get used to. He'd been interviewed, um, everything was lawful and above board, and that was it, and he was going to be remanded. So we gave him a beer. And you could hear on those tapes how he just loved doing stick-ups. Oh, it does. He yeah. does, yeah. Um, having spoken to him over the years, uh, he says the, the adrenaline rush and, and the, the thrill of it, he said there's nothing like it. He says it's better than sex. Mm. You know, it was just such a high. Yeah. Binns was a master escape artist, having escaped six times. It was these many escapes that led him to his severest jail sentences. Starting back in 1992, he escaped from St Vincent's Hospital security ward in Melbourne using a smuggled gun left in the hospital. And before that, he escaped from Parramatta Prison. So he's a slippery character to... Because uh, he did backflips out of somewhere, I think, just to well, get away. From St Vincent's Hospital here, he uh, had himself stabbed at Pentridge and then went to St Vincent's and it was there that he escaped from the custody there, produced a pistol. Um, that we believe was brought in by his father behind his belt buckle. And he fled the state and he went to Sydney. And he did some several hold-ups up there in Sydney and he did them with Jockey Smith, who was up there at the time. Now, Binns got caught and he was charged. Of course, again in Sydney, he, he escaped from Parramatta and uh, was described as a, <laughs> like a Batman-type escape. He jumped over the walls and, and fled and he was away again. And then he surfaces back down here at uh, the farm with Jockey Smith just out of Dalesford. They're laying low there until one afternoon uh, Jockey Smith decides to drive into town and then has an altercation with the local policeman, which uh, didn't end well for Jockey. You know, poor old Dizzy Harris was just just there. Yep. And, um, you know, gets into a confrontation and, mm. and shoots him dead. Correct. Born in Geelong, Smith was also known as the Jockey because of his small stature and love of horses. One of Australia's most notorious criminals dying after an exchange of gunfire with a lone patrol officer. The shootout as violent as the circumstances of Smith's life. That uh, didn't end well for Jockey, but at that time, the uh, information was that Binns and Jockey Smith were at, at this farmhouse. So the SOG acted accordingly and got Binns in the house and he was arrested and then taken back to the armed robbery squad and, and spoken to there. So because of all his escapes, um, Binns has probably done the hardest jail of, of any crook in Australia. He's been in lockdown for 23 hours a day for years, mm. solitary confinement. Totally institutionalised. Shackled a yep. lot. Funny, I, I started to write a story about him and he, he wrote a very funny letter to mm. me just saying something like... Um, people who stop counting their blessings because their arithmetic is very poor and he always had the dollar signs on mm. his S's. Mm. Um, badness. But, yeah, badness. Over the years I received quite a few letters from Chris. I actually looked forward to them. He always had a way with words. After a while he clearly went sour on me. Probably my own fault because I tended to tease him on radio referring to the fact that he'd had a hair transplant which didn't work and that his nickname shouldn't be badness but baldness. Also I might have referred to him as rubbish bins. This is David Armstrong from 3AW reading one of those pleasant letters I received from Chris. Slime of the underworld, the sewerage dweller. You should really consider a change in living environments as it affects the manner in which you present yourself in your work. It's obvious that you are a gutter, low-life rodent who's awash in rubbish, crap and shit. Yet I've come to learn to expect nothing more from you for you are incapable or unable to present accounts accurately or bother to investigate the validity or authenticity of the claims you portray in your articles as irrefutable and genuine in nature. Poor, gullible public. It's beyond comprehension how a paper such as The Age of High Standing Quality persists in attaining your poor, inferior services in which you offer. You seriously leave a lot to be desired. Be warned, if you drop your guard or slip up and offer me the slightest remote opportunity to run you through the courts in any way, shape or form by 
Suggestions of any nature, inferring, implying my involvement in any crimes or conduct, I will not hesitate to do so. Truth be known, I'm sweating on you, and I relish the chance. It'd be wonderful, though, having you in amongst us on this side of the fence. Be real nice. Chris Bins. Then I started getting the letters, I'm just sweating on you, doing something wrong, because it'd be real nice to have you in here. Mm. And I wouldn't even jaywalk for five years because I wasn't going in there with him. When Chris finally got out, he tried to leave $600 for the prison guard so they could have a piss-up. Always wanting to leave in style, Chris left prison with a stretch limo filled with escort girls. And if we remember not that long ago, when he did get out, he um, held up an armour guard truck by himself. Not only did he love robbing, but he was good at it too. Bin says from the age of nine, he started to study the routine of bank guards delivering cash. In 2012, he robbed an armour guard van. The CCTV footage shows an armed Bin's in total control. Which he's quite capable of doing. Took their revolvers and I think about $200,000 or something. Police immediately suspected it was him because there weren't too many people left who could do a stick-up as well as Chris. Soon he was caught in a siege, trapped by police for 44 hours in East Keelor, outside of Melbourne. And uh, then there was the famous siege just shortly after that. That's in East Keelor, mm. 38 hours or 44 hours or something like that. Correct, yeah. It ended when the Special Operations Group, the SOG, bombed his house, tear-gassed him and shot him with several shots of beanbag fired from a shotgun. Before the siege, there was a suggestion that I was on a list of those he wished to have a chat with. I'm sure it would have been amicable, of course. Yeah, and they recovered those guns from that uh, that hold-up there. He, he'd sort of given a, a verbal will to his girlfriend there because he fully expected to die at the hands of the police. Yes. He had a ballistic vest on. Um, the police threw in a distraction bomb, which was very distracting because it blew up half the house. <laughs> Correct, yeah. And they tear-gassed him. Which is odd because tear gas isn't generally used. Yes, yeah, so that's how, t how dangerous he is. He mm. goes out, he starts firing, he can't see. He's deaf from the, from the bomb. And the SOG come out and shoot him five times mm. with beanbag shot. Mm. He doesn't know that. He thinks they're trying to kill him. Mm. He goes down, he gets up, he shot another two times before they grab him. And I know that there was a doctor there, so they quickly checked his pulse. And his heart rate was 80. Mm, go figure. Most people, when they miss a putt, their heart rate's higher than that. He's been shot seven times, mm. bombed and tear-gassed. He's got to be one of the, uh, the luckiest crooks walking the face of the earth. Bins actually wrote to the SOG critiquing their work and asking for a beanbag shot as a memento. The request was refused. He gets locked up for his kilo and goes in and um, I think you were kind enough to make contact with him because... Ken regularly received letters from Chris... Um, which were much nicer than the ones he used to send me. After 30 years, Chris had really warmed to Ken and perhaps saw him as a friend, something that Ken still reflects on. Yeah, as a prolific letter writer, he would always write me letters um, wherever I worked. He always followed where I worked, um, congratulated me on my promotions over the years. And um, at one stage, he, he did the old trick that a lot of the crooks do writes me a false confession to some hold-ups. Well, I knew he hadn't done the hold-ups because we'd actually convicted other people of the hold-ups. So I wrote back to him. I said, I'm not going to waste my time. Don't bother. You know, you are, you know, I thought you were better than that. Anyway, uh, time goes on and I get another letter and he says, look, I'd really like to, to see you again um, and I'll talk about those hold-ups that I wasn't charged with that you interviewed me over. I want to confess to them. And this is only a couple of years ago, I think about 15 or something. Uh, and I think I was working at Piranha at the time, so I arranged for the armed crime task force, a couple of detectives there, to meet me down at Barwon. So we go in there. He comes out with a big smile on his face. He says, Ashy. <laughs> I say, like, hello, Chris. So we shake hands and uh, he says, oh, it's good to see you. And he pats me on the back. I said, yeah, you're looking well. And as you would greet anybody, you know. And uh, I look across and there's the, the two fellows from Armed Crime look at me and think, 
what's going on here? What have, what have I walked into here? Like, uh, I was a crook myself. He would turn to the detectives from um, crime and say, when Ashy and I were working together, and I said, hang on, Chris, hang on, we never worked together. You know, I wore the white hat, you wore the black hat. Let's get that very clear. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. But uh, that two and a half hours or so, it was just uh, a laugh and a giggle show and, and it was like, uh, you know, old home week with him. So, and then he, he fronted up to the Supreme Court and he, uh, he nodded, pleaded guilty to all the charges. Chris decided to confess to all seven armed robberies from 1988, 89 and 91, worth $390,000. He told police, it's all or nothing, seriously. For me to make it right, it's got to be 100%. Which makes you wonder whether he was born bad or was twisted by a brutal upbringing. Yeah, it's a, it's He's got a massive sentence. I, I don't know when he gets out. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. At this point, he'd given up on lawyers and was representing himself. Perhaps that wasn't the best idea because he got a monster 14-year sentence for the 44-hour siege, for which he is currently serving at Barwon Prison. For those who demand tougher sentences, they should remember that when they're eventually released, they've been brutalised on the inside. Maximum security prisons are filled with violent men who live in unnatural conditions, which means they invariably fall out, and Binz is no exception. Oh, absolutely. He, he took pride in showing me his scars where he almost died. Um, I think it was uh, Johnson, the bloke that killed um, Carl Williams. Carl Williams had stabbed him. Uh, so they're separated there, and he's got this huge scar. He almost bled out. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, he was saying that day, the last time I spoke to him, that he suffers PTSD. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I said, how do you work that out? And he goes, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, around Braybrook, Sunshine Way, and um, every interaction I had with the coppers, I'd jack them up, but they'd jack me up. And, you know, I'm just used to getting to hiding and, you know, I'm in boys' homes and prison and all that sort of stuff. And interesting angle on PTSD from, from a crook side. Well, it's interesting if you, th you look at the gangsters who've been murdered over the journey mm. and, you know, how they always talk about, oh, I just want to live the, you know, the fast life, I don't care whether I live or die. Mm. Most of them have antidepressants or sedatives in their system. So, yeah. um, in the end, a lot of them, I reckon, are self-medicating. Absolutely. Um, and there's not too many of the old school, if you will, left around. Yeah. Here's David Armstrong reading one of the last letters I got from Chris Binns. To my old nemesis, sly of the underworld, John Sylvester at the Age newspaper. Greetings to you. It's funny how life takes turns and the directions and journeys we make. I am misunderstood by the masses and in recent years have undertaken measures to amend the sinister, recalcitrant figure cast and moulded by those in the media, you included. I have prepared much in revealing my life and the many tragic twists and turns and crashes I have encountered, some head-on and leaving me permanently damaged by it. Ken Ashworth worked on many of Australia's worst crooks. His career is winding down now and he's looking forward to travel and family time. Chris Pins is at least 10 years to serve. And while he should always be treated as a dangerous criminal, there is a duty to try and move him on into more humane conditions in preparation for his ultimate release. There can be no doubt that the years of solitary have damaged an already damaged individual. By confessing, Binz has taken the first step to reform. Now we have to prepare a path for him to walk away from a wasted life. Whether he makes that journey, ultimately, will be a matter for him. Naked City is brought to you by The Age and Sydney Morning Herald. Subscriptions power our newsroom, so to support independent journalism, consider subscribing to the Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. This episode is produced and edited by Anu the Axe Hasbold, Margaret Machine Gun Gordon and mixed and mastered by Jellic Knight John Greenfield with technical assistance from Cool Hand Cormac Lally. Tom McHendrick is Head of Audio. The voice of Chris Binns is Dangerous Dave Armstrong from 3AW. Archival is thanks to 9 and 3AW. I'm John Sylvester. Thanks for listening. Next episode is about Traders Within, how they tried to kill undercover policeman Mick Drury. And this bloke grabbed me by the knee. I said, mate, get your hands off my knee or I'll smash you right in the fucking eye. 
but it wasn't. It was the policeman had been shot. And he said, Brian, I'm uh, Mick Drury. He said, you know, you're the only two coppers that are sticking up for me. The rest want me gone. 